folks. Welcome back to CSC 234. Is it not loud enough? Okay, now it's much better. Um, thanks again for showing up for the uh, third guest lecture. This one is by Sumant. He's a second year student in CSE, right? Working with uh, Julian on uh, in-context learning of language models. He's worked on fine-tuning of language models at C3AI and has made open source contributions, including to the Hugging Face PEFT library. Hugging Face, of course, is famously the company that uses the emoji as their logo. He completed his bachelor's in electrical engineering at the IIT Madras, which also happens to be my alma mater. So, yay, go IIT Madras. <laughs> He's an incoming software engineer at any scale. And uh, we've had uh, Hal give a guest lecture. He's also actually working with any scale. So, a lot of connections with any scale here. So, Suman's stock is, of course, included in the syllabus for your midterm. So, please pay attention. And as always, we grill the speakers in this course. So, please ask questions. Raise your hand and ask questions. Take it away, Suman. All right. Thank you, Professor. <coughs> so, yeah. Hi, I'm Suman. And the focus for this talk is all about efficient fine tuning of LLMs. So, this is like a distillation of work I've been doing like the past year working with uh, fine tuning and also with parameter efficient fine tuning. And these are just like broad intuitions to have when you're deciding on uh, how to fine tune, like how to think about speed and memory, et cetera. So the outline for the talk, I'll give a brief primer on language models, which I think a lot of you might be bored with already. And then I'll get into what fine tuning is all about a bit about uh, the metrics. So what do we care about really, right? What are the things you need to balance out? And then we'll get to actual like throughput and memory optimizations, uh, broadly five that I'll be discussing. Some are just plain efficient training techniques. You probably worked with them before. And some are fine tuning techniques and we'll get into the details of memory there. Okay, so now a brief primer on large language models. So the context is that these are large in the sense that deep networks that have billions of parameters. These are language models. They're working towards predicting the probability of words in a sentence. And you've got different variants. And these can affect like your um, flops, et cetera, right? And causal language models, Lama, GPT is the more popular version. But you've also got sequence to sequence. And the underlying architecture that becomes important when you're thinking about uh, memory, throughput, et cetera, is uh, the transformer, which we'll be like, focusing on. OK, so what's so special about these LLMs and what's uh, probably like part of the hype? Uh, one thing is that these are trained on trillions of tokens, and they've been able to distill like, some amount of world knowledge in terms of reasoning, et cetera. One more is unsupervised learning, so they're convenient to train because a lot of these skills are learned without explicit labels. And then you've got this, I would say, a bit more abstract and maybe messy uh, phenomenon of emergence, which uh, is quantified as when you're scaling parameters from n to 10n, along with scaling your data set, there are some significant performance gains on some tasks. And that is what emergence is. And it's about new skills and also like this ability to compose different skills. You can actually have a look at this talk from Professor Sanjeev Arora on this, who's actually worked on modeling this theoretically. OK, so these language models are bringing about a new era in DL systems, borrowing Professor Arun Kumar's term. And like, You've got billions of parameters, right? Llama models, tens of billions. GPT-3, hundreds of billions, right? In terms of data, it's trillions of tokens for the pre-training. It's millions of tokens for fine-tuning. So in terms of resources, you've got tens of gigabytes at minimum for inference, hundreds of gigabytes for training, uh, even like the smallest of these models. And one more thing that we're seeing uh, come about a bit recently is that you can now uh, train the same model for multiple use cases 
And you can do that using new parameter efficient techniques where you will have the same base model, but then you can have a weight add-on which will encode task information, such as tool use, summarization, conversation here. OK, so now we'll get into fine tuning. And now a very initial like background, which might be clear for most of you. So pre-training, like I said, like you're training a language model from scratch. So this, in terms of timeline, it's months. And in terms of compute, you've got like, multiple nodes, each with like eight GPUs, maybe. In terms of what prompting and in-context learning is about, you're looking at uh, feeding the language model with a few demonstrations of your task. And you just provide that in context. You don't make any parameter updates. And this just happens in seconds, right? Fine tuning is like our middle ground where we're updating the pre-trained model. But now, in terms of data, this is like thousands or like millions of examples. And the timeline is hours or days, maybe weeks. And you're mostly like using this in like a small scale, at max small scale multi-node. And yeah, the idea or like the benefits of this is that you will all most likely get much better use case specific performance than in context learning. OK, so we want to fine tune models, right? But we also like care about multiple things while we're doing this. And in terms of like really like rough metrics, you want training to proceed as fast as possible. So you care about speed or throughput. You want to use as little resources as possible, so you care about memory. And you also want to make the model as performant as possible, so you care about model performance. Model performance is one thing we won't uh, think about here, because that's set by you for your task, your benchmark. OK, so in terms of speed, right? one thing like that's very helpful to have in mind, um, one equation in terms of time it takes for any operation on a GPU, Right, this is basic stuff you've probably seen this, but the idea is that like the total time depends on the time it takes for accessing memory, reading and writing from global memory, so that's TMM. And then you have time it takes for the math operations, which is your actual useful work. And that includes your arithmetic operations, accumulation, etc. And then you have latency, which is more like a catch-all term for everything else. You can also maybe view this as overhead and one uh, example is that like you're writing maybe Python code, there's some time in executing, uh, there's some time like in like executing your PyTorch statements on the CPU and then like actually dispatching CUDA kernels onto the GPU. So that can come up into your latency term here. Now, uh, one helpful thing to have in mind is that it's really the maximum among these two terms that dictate like uh, time it takes. And the reason is that you can overlap computation, of course, between uh, like different threads. So this is what you care about in terms of like uh, at a lower level for operations on the GPU. This one more metric, GPU utilization, right? And this is what you'll probably monitor, 1DB, whatever, right? And this is like the percentage of GPU processing power used in terms of the exact details, it's not very clear because you do get only like one API to use from NVIDIA. But you can just think of this as, OK, like I have like a bunch of available cores, right? thousands of cores in current GPUs. Uh, you want to make sure you use all of them at a point, at like a given point in time. OK, coming to throughput, all right, the simple view to think about is just in terms of like samples per second or tokens per second, because this will just dictate like your total training time. But one more thing you can think about is, given a particular workload, you want to maximize time spent in this area. You want to maximize time spent doing just math operations. Make sure you don't have memory uh, like overhead or like overhead from your Python interpreter or PyTorch. So you can also just think about measuring flops itself, floating point operations per second. For throughput that we are going to look at, it's helpful to just think about samples per second because you can compare across like different settings as well. And um, yeah, one more metric that is used is model flops utilization, which is basically just measuring your observed throughput as a ratio with the peak achievable throughput that's given to you, uh, like that's the specification given to you from like NVIDIA. And you, you want to make sure you can touch that. 
And there's, of course, some more metrics that people do use, and it always depends on like, which regime you're in, like training, inference, et cetera. But for now, like, we'll just think about samples or like, tokens per second uh, for throughput. OK, so <clears throat> efficient fine tuning, right? The focus is prioritizing memory, but also maybe we won't do too bad on throughput. So to get there, we'll first actually go through like a requirements breakdown, focusing on the transformer. I'll go over that a bit quickly because the details can be distracting. And then we'll quickly go over mixed precision, focus a bit more on uh, PEFT and quantization, and then also touch upon uh, checkpointing and accumulation. OK, the memory requirements break down here. This is like the classic equation for any deep learning training, right? You've got weights, gradients, optimizer state, and also activations. In a typical training setting, like you've got four bytes per parameter. That's your requirement. Gradients, you've got four bytes per parameter again. And uh, optimizer state, of course, depends on like what you're using. So in case you're going for Adam, Adam W, like that's going to take up eight bytes per parameter because you've got like two things to maintain per element. Activation is a bit more complicated. It's more involved because it's architecture dependent. Like it depends on what architecture you're using, and of course depends on your input size. So that's batch size and number of tokens. Okay, so now I'll quickly go through like. Um, a derivation here for activation memory, it, just to give some intuition for where memory consumption is. Um, let's say the number of bytes per element is NB, right? Half precision, full precision, like there's gonna be a difference. Sequence length S, uh, batch size B, and hidden dimension uh, H. You can assume A attention heads, and let's say there are L such transformer layers. So A attention heads in this block, and L such layers in total. Now, in terms of input activation size, right here at the beginning, that would be um, number of bytes times number of elements, right? Simple. Now, when we get into the details for, okay, like per layer here, like what is um, the intermediate activation size, those details are a bit hairy, but in summary, what you need to think about is in the self-attention block, you need to store multiple activations in terms of like, like you've got key, query, value layers, you've got an output, and then finally you've got like an output projection layer. So all of those terms come in here. For your attention matrix, you in fact get this S square term, and that'll play a big role when you're thinking about uh, efficient training later on. With your MLP block, it's pretty straightforward. Um, you can derive this yourself, and it's going to be mostly just linear in um, like your activation size. And then you need to like also consider some terms for the layer normalization layers as well. All in all, you end up with like this big messy equation. You've got a bigger factor here for uh, which is like linear, and then you've got a second order term here. And like at a smaller sequence length, the first term would play a bigger role. So in this case, a typical like uh, fine tuning setting, like you're training maybe Llama 7B, right? Uh, if your sequence length is small, it probably only comes out to be about five gigabytes. But if I actually make the sequence length like eight times, then the total memory in fact becomes 20 times bigger. And that's mostly dominated by the S square term. And more on this, this is like a modified version from uh, of like the derivation in this paper, and like you can go through the details uh, there. <laughs> okay, so our focus right now is on the single GPU setting, and we're mostly looking at memory, but trying to balance throughput. And really, only two questions matter here. Your first step is to see, okay, like can I train with batch size equal to one, which means can I go from zero to one? And then you'll say, okay, now can I increase batch size? Can I go from one to n? The way you will reason about your trade-offs as well with throughput will depend on like which uh, place you're in. The trade-offs, of course, are throughput and model performance. 
Now, one thing to keep in mind is that in terms of where you want to go with batch size, typically in terms of gradient updates and how stable training would be, you shouldn't have problems even with, like, say, n equal to 4. The main reason you would increase batch size is utilization, like I said. Your GPUs, right, you always operate them in this massively data parallel setting. So you want to keep your course busy. So at a given, for a given setup, you want to maximize batch size as much as memory will permit. But larger batch size does not, of course, mean more throughput. And like, what I mean by that is when you're comparing across two different settings. For the same setup, you should, of course, like maximize batch size. If you compare two different settings with maybe one with checkpointing, one without, like, you can't just say, OK, I've got a larger batch size. Things are better. This is like a high-level summary now for all the optimizations we'll be discussing. We'll be circling back to this. But the idea is that you can save memory with all of them. Throughput is better with mixed precision and PEFT. And in terms of model performance, you should maybe think about your hyperparameters for uh, parameter efficient fine tuning and quantization. We'll come back to the same table later on. So right now, that's just the high level um, gist. OK, so mixed precision, right? Um, basic efficient training, probably you've worked with this already multiple times. The idea is that your weights, activations, and gradients are in lower precision. But the optimizer state is in full precision. And let's first think about memory, and then we can discuss why this is the way it is. So model weights and gradients right, like would, in fact, be just two bytes per parameter. In reality, like the way this works is all your computations are done in half precision. right? I'm taking the example for half precision here. So your matrix multiplications will happen in this lower precision setting, so it's faster. But your optimizer step needs higher precision because you want to have an accurate weight update. The weight update has to be accurate. So what ends up happening is you will convert your gradients back to full precision and then execute uh, the weight update. So in reality, with gradients, this in fact becomes four bytes. And each byte matters when you're dealing with like billions of parameters. Activation state, of course, it's um, two bytes. Optimizer state now, um, before we had mentioned eight bytes, it's now 12 bytes. The main reason is that you need to also keep a master copy of the weights. Like I said, like the reason you operate this in full precision is because you want an accurate weight update. Using a lower precision format truncates those lower end bits. And you don't want to lose that information for uh, like while you're training. Otherwise, it'll have issues with conversions. So if you notice now, before we were in fact dealing with 16 bytes per parameter for non-activation memory, and now we're dealing with 18 bytes because the gradient needs four bytes. You've got this extra copy. So overall, non-activation memory has in fact increased, but you've got some savings in activation memory. And so these can like dominate uh, depending on like what setting you're in. Coming to throughput, like I said, like the matrix multiplications themselves, they happen in lower precision. And NVIDIA has special cores as well, tensor cores, which are popular now for those are present in like all GPUs right now um, for the past few years. So these will be able to do those matrix multiplications in half precision like much, much faster. And overall, from NVIDIA's own uh, guides, you'll probably expect about 2 to 4x speed up. Um, sometimes even more. A bit more into the formats, if you're not very familiar with them, we're looking at only two formats right now, FP16 and BF16. And FP16, the main problem is the range. And that's because of this exponent that's shrunk. With FP32, you've got eight bits in the exponent. But FP16, you end up with just five bits. So that affects the range severely. And it's not just the maximum. It's also the lowest possible value you can represent. So because of the smaller range, small gradients can get reduced to zeros because you just don't have the precision to represent those small values as well. So um, that affects training stability. And this 
loss scaling that's done. Uh, you might have used PyTorch's AMP, Automatic mi Mixed Precision, which takes care of this for you. But this is something that's like an extra step needed for FP16. Whereas Bfloat16, the other format here, the number of exponent bits is the same. So you retain the same range, but you've lost precision here because you kind of chopped off these lower like 16 bits. And in terms of training stability, BF16 is better. It's also often used in pre-training, which means like that's a better format to use when you're fine tuning. There's a new format which I don't have much experience with, FP8, it's still emerging, not much library support as far as I'm aware, but that's gonna reduce number of bits for your weight to just eight. Um, just a simple plot here to give more intuition for FP16. So uh, if you look at the log value for range, for like values you can represent, all the values, all the numbers for FP16 fall in this small bucket here. For BF16 and FP32, they fall in the same range. What happens is that you can have a gradient value here with this log value and small gradients are common during training and with FP16 that gets reduced to a zero. Loss scaling is just about moving this bucket to where the gradient is so that you don't have uh, like this truncation. Um, and yet as such for performance, like if you're thinking it doesn't really matter for you because right now dynamic loss scaling is implemented uh, been quite a few years and for fine tuning I think either would probably work for you. So trade-off wise, performance shouldn't be a big problem. In terms of like uh, analyzing the lower precision formats themselves, uh, one thing to keep in mind is that like this will have like lower TMM and TMAT in terms of like advantages because you need to access lesser memory like in HBM you've stored, you're, like you're storing them in lesser bytes and you can also operate on them faster but the problem is that accumulation is lossy, which means like you can't really add a lot of these values together without losing some information. And so, you c and so direct weight updates can't happen. You'll need to have something else. And small range, of course, implies small gradients are lost. This is like the main trade-offs you need to make. And like if you read papers on how FP8 works or FP16 works, like this is what they need to, this is what they're thinking about when they're designing. Um, how training works. Okay, now we will uh, get into parameter efficient fine tuning. So the motivation here is that you don't really need to always update all the model weights. And also that when you're fine tuning, you typically, I mean, in like a corporate setting, you're not just gonna be fine tuning for one task, you'll have multiple tasks, and uh, you're probably running multiple sets of experiments. It's pretty expensive to keep maintaining like a full uh, copy of all your model weights. What PEFT methods allow you to do is to train just a small number of extra parameters and you can freeze the pre-trained weights. The benefits are lesser memory requirements and better throughput and we'll see how that works. The trade-off, it's in performance but usually not much and sometimes it's also when you're doing inference, it's also an inference latency. Now for this talk, I'll only be focusing on LoRa, which is the most versatile and also popular one, but some references for other PFT methods that have come about. This was one of the first methods that came up, adapter, and their main idea was to add a trainable block right after attention and right after the MLP block we saw. So in each transformer layer, you'll have two of these add-ons, and each adapter block looks, again, like an MLP block, and you can change the dimensions here to kind of uh, make this more efficient. However, like LoRa has better performance, and also you are modifying the model architecture here, so inference costs will like rise up. And there's one more IA cube, which can be used in like a different setting than LoRa. IA cube is um, it's a method which 
scales activations. So it uses these learned vectors, and it scales activations at multiple parts of your transformer layer. And the main regime where you, you will use IA3 is when you're really data constrained, and you will use it as opposed to doing like few short learning. So if you just have like 50 examples, you can actually use IA3 and uh, fine tune these small weights, and you'll probably get good enough performance. Okay, like I said, yeah, we'll be focusing on uh, LoRa. So the basic uh, equations are pretty simple. Instead of a typical linear layer, you now have this additional parallel branch. And what they've done is they've first of all done a reparameterization. In terms of updating weights, they're looking at the delta. And that delta has been, uh, there's a low rank decomposition for the delta. And you've got two trainable matrices. In terms of knobs, you can tweak. You've got the rank. Uh, the most important one, as it turns out, is the list of layers you will apply this to. And you also have a scaling factor here, which um, in hindsight doesn't do much um, right now. So it's really just about the rank and also the list of layers to apply to that you would be choosing. At inference time, you can just, of course, merge the weights. You can just add the delta to the W, and you're now left with the same network, which means same cost. So we'll now go into the details for memory savings. So if you're doing full parameter fine tuning and you're doing mixed position uh, training, your weights will take up about 26 gigabytes for this 13 billion parameter model. Your gradients take up 52 gigabytes because of that conversion that I said in effect. Optimizer state ends up taking 156 gigabytes. So this is where like, you have uh, the biggest I would say, memory usage. And so your total is now like more than 230 gigabytes. So there's no way you're like fine tuning this on like a single GPU. With LoRa, if you assume like 0.4% more parameters here, which is typical, like you'll use ranks like eight, 16. So you'll probably see like some number like this. So in a typical LoRa setting, the base weights remain the same, take up the same amount of memory. The LoRa weights take up just about 100 megabytes, so pretty minimal um, additional usage. The gradients take up just 0.2 uh, gigabytes, or like around 200 megabytes. So that's, that is like one big difference that you can see. You've kind of eliminated 50 gigabytes of memory usage. The optimizer state now, uh, that takes up just 0.62 gigabytes. So if you look at the difference in terms of total memory consumption, you'll see like PFT is really about like this optimizer state uh, and of course gradient as well. So you're now, yeah. So does LoRa apply this low rank factorized matrix thing for every layer of the neural net? Yeah, that's. Yeah, so in terms of which layers it's applied to, it, you can choose the linear layers where you can apply it to. And so you can just say, I want to apply it to just to the key value uh, layers in all the attention blocks. Uh, right now, what's more, like, more performant is to apply it to every linear layer. So you'll apply it to the key va query value, apply it to the output projection layer, the MLP block. So everything that's a linear layer, you're applying uh, LoRa to. Um, right now, if you're working uh, with Hugging Face, like you can specify just the list of layers in one block, and it gets applied to like all the blocks. So you can just say key, query, value. And right now, there's a new feature as well. Like you just up, say all linear, and like you can apply it to everything. So that's a bit like library specific, but yeah, like user interface wise, you just specify like a few strings. Yeah, and one more, of course, uh, point is that your checkpoints now become tiny in size. So you just need to store these LoRa weights. And the base weights you can just retrieve uh, from like um, the hub or something, right? 
So in terms of trade-offs, LoRa and IA Cube, they enable efficient training without an increase in inference latency. And that means you can merge the additional weights. Throughput uh, pretty much depends, like I think throughout, like for throughput, for fine tuning at least, it depends on your setting. Uh, one thing that seems to be roughly right is the 25% speed up for GPT-3 that they mentioned in the paper. It should also translate roughly to even other models that you'll be using. Performance-wise, um, it is sometimes worse than full parameter. So there was some benchmarking done. Even if you do apply LoRa to all the layers, there are some data sets like um, a hard math data set that was used where you saw a bigger difference between full parameter and LoRa. But mostly for, like say, instruction tuning or many other tasks, you should be able to match full fine tuning performance. And the key point is to add it to all the linear layers um, in your network. Okay, so one more like helpful like I guess mental model to have with PEFT. Um, it's this notion of uh, being able to use specialist models versus large generalist models. So the figure here is from the IA Cube uh, paper, and uh, the comparison is between GPT-3 in an ICL setting, so you're passing in multiple demonstrations, and you're measuring flops per example, per test example. The flops are higher because these are large models and also because you're processing more tokens. However, you can now use a model like T0, and then there's this model T few, which is just T0 plus IA cube. And the idea is that you can use these uh, smaller models at a zero shot setting after fine tuning, rather than using the big model in a few shot setting, even if their world knowledge is better. So what PFT methods allow you to do is to build a whole a basket of fine tunes on different tasks. And like I said, it's just this weight add-on that you keep. And they can all share the same base model. And there's some follow-up work from the same team, uh, from uh, Colin Raphael's team, where they've worked on routing different examples to an appropriate task at inference. And so this makes things a lot more efficient, even during uh, inference. OK, so that was like a quick run through for PFT. Um, any questions till now? Uh, in terms of what values work. So the rank parameter in the original paper at least was like four or something. And the rundown, that would work out to be like less than 0.1% of total parameters if you set a rank that low. Uh, uh, later on in follow-up work in QLoRa, they've shown that rank from like even eight to 64, like more or less gives you the same performance. So you can set rank to be 8, 16, 64, somewhere in that range. You should get good enough uh, performance. That's curious. Yeah, it is, it's a bit, uh, it's not very intuitive in terms of how the rank works. Um, and what's more interesting is that adding it to all the layers worked better than uh, the rank. Like the rank is, I think to some extent it is gonna give you flexibility and more expressiveness. But beyond a point, it doesn't matter. That's, I think, what happens. Because IA cube, for example, like if you benchmark on decent enough uh, like tasks with like thousands of examples, you will find that it doesn't perform as well with LoRa. It's very parameter efficient. It uses 0.01% or something. But so number of parameters does matter. But I think uh, based on like LoRa's reparameterization, beyond a point, it doesn't matter. Yeah, all layers fixed rank. Yeah. So um, the, the typical fine tuning that we were taught maybe a couple of years ago was that we would take the original network, put some fully connected layers at the end with a low dimension, and maybe increase some of the last original layers, right? And that would still be a low number of parameters compared to the full network, right? But did you show any of that? 
So they might have benchmarked against this. Um, one of the settings that you're talking about is typically in like this classification setting where you add a fully connected layer with a custom number of classification heads, like in terms of final, the, the final um, output vector that you get because the number of labels that you have will change. But right now, when you're thinking about language models, you're still using them for the task of like next word prediction. So the final output layer will still be like that embedding layer, which converts um, like, a, um, like your vector, and it gives you back the token ID, and then that gets decoded into the appropriate token. So like the output layer is still like just normal classification. Like you have softmax in the end. So um, output layer wise, I think typically you don't really change. Uh, in terms of the benchmarking they've done, I don't recall, but they might not have looked towards changing the classification head itself because you are you're still you still want to predict all those same tokens itself. So the classification layer has the same number of parameters there. If that makes sense. Okay, so now um, I'll get into quantization, or uh, really about the QLoRa paper. First, I think it's helpful to just get a quick run through for what quantization is. Of course, we're talking about being able to use lesser bits to represent the same values. And typically what's done is something like this, which is a range-based linear quantization. Um, this, in this case, what you're doing is you are having this input vector of values, of floats, right? And the idea is to bring them down to a representable range. Here it's int 8, you can go from minus 128 to 127. So what you're doing is you wanna now scale the maximum down. So you get the absolute maximum, you scale, you find like a scaling factor to get to 127. You multiply with that scaling factor and then you just do rounding you round to the nearest integer. So th that max value is now 127. The rest gets scaled. They're all in this nice range. You can use your, you can just use eight bits to represent them. And that's about it, right? So in QLoRa, the idea was um, we just want to quantize the base weights. And what, we, what they do in the forward pass is they dequantize the base weights and then just compute activations as usual in half position or full position. This is not as simple as I've put it because uh, you are losing information when you quantize. So they came up with a new representation, a new data type uh, called normal float. And they of course also have written like custom CUDA kernels for efficient matrix multiplications. You wanna do this like conversion on the fly and not write it back into like global memory. And there's also double quantization. So the quantization constant that I talked about, the scaling factor, you need to maintain that because you would want to recover the original float range, right? You can convert to float, scale the quantized values down to get back your floats. And you want to maintain that, but then that also gets expensive. So they've got double quantization, which does like a next level uh, quantization. And there's some more details in the paper, but right now, uh, we'll just think about, okay, like, what happens to memory? So we're coming back to the same uh, PFT setting. So all the numbers remain the same. But if you observe here, you've kind of uh, destroyed, like, gradient and optimizer state. This like, literally, like, one gigabyte that you need to maintain all of this. But the base weights really are what matter with LoRa. And QLoRa, uh, right now, I've taken the four bit example. So each weight element just takes four bits or half a byte uh, in memory. In that case, the base weights uh, move to about just seven gigabytes, less than seven gigabytes. And all the other terms, they remain the same. So now if you think from where we've come, we've come from about more than 200 gigabytes all the way to seven gigabytes. And one more thing that's shown in the paper is you can actually like fine tune a 20 billion parameter model with just like 16, um, 16 GB HBM. So that's like a collab instance. In terms of trade-offs, so 
like I mentioned, so throughput is going to decrease with quantization. And the reason is that you now have this extra dequantization step in the forward pass. And if you think about it, like your matrix multiplications, right, um, that's like one operation you're doing on your GPU. You need to think about, okay, like which regime am I in? Um, you can go back to like that max equation, max of T memory and T math, right? Uh, you're doing a lot more math operations per element uh, compared to number of bytes accessed, like arithmetic intensity. So you're more in this T math regime, in the compute bound regime, and you're now adding on to that more uh, computations. And so the gain that you do get in maybe accessing memory, it's not offset in practice, and you end up with worse throughput. Exact numbers will depend. This is just one um, that I can quote because I don't want to put my own number here. Performance-wise, um, QLoRa can match full parameter fine-tuning. And that's, again, after you first fix LoRa, you make sure you add it to all the layers. And then you can quantize, and their four-bit representation will help in not degrading performance too much. So the rounding errors, that is. So in terms of intuition you want to have, when you think about, OK, when should I use quantization? This is typically in a consumer hardware setup. You're thinking about using this locally or maybe in a collab instance. And you want to train really large models. So one example here is like you've got two 3090s, and you want to fine tune a 33 billion parameter model, right? So this is like the difference that uh, is probably like needed for QLoRa to kick in. Otherwise, like if you are ever in like a multi GPU setting, you almost never uh, need it because you can get away with LoRa and parallelism typically, and that is kind of like the broad uh, intuition to have. Okay, so I will probably go through these a bit quicker than the other two topics because this is just typical efficient training. So we're talking about activation checkpointing, right? And the basic idea is uh, in, in usual training, you have all your intermediate activations that are saved during the forward pass because you want them while computing gradients. And till now, we've actually avoided talking about activation memory. That's kind of been left out because that's more or less stayed constant in both PEFT and quantization. But now, like to put a number to it, for uh, half precision training, that works out to be about 21 gigabytes. You can use the formula that I put up before. And activation checkpointing, the main idea is that you will just save a few, right? You'll just save a few intermediate activations here. And what's available in all popular libraries right now is just that is the simple gradient checkpointing strategy, or it's also called full activation recomputation. And the idea is you just save the activations in the first layer. And for the rest, intermediate activations are going to be like temporary variables. You'll, you'll not store them. And finally, when you do go through the backward pass, uh, when you arrive at this checkpoint at the end, you need to do one more additional forward pass to recompute all of these intermediate activations. And then like you've kind of built up your graph again. You can now propagate gradients. Um, you can do that like block by block. In terms of uh, the slowdown, uh, some papers have like benchmarked it. And this, the full activation recomputation strategy, you can probably expect about a 30% slowdown. And there's also like uh, the memory, right? So you can actually just like try to plug in the equation for uh, activation memory, uh, just considering input activations. And uh, that comes out to be about 800 megabytes. There's going to be some more apart from this, but we can talk about that later. OK, again, uh, gradient accumulation, a simple uh, like efficient training strategy. The goal like right now is in increasing batch size. It's in maximizing batch size. So. The reason you would do this is, given a particular um, setup, right? you want to increase batch size because you want to utilize all the available cores in your GPU. 
And one more reason could be that you want better gradient updates, especially if you're using something like batch norm. So you want to maximize uh, batch size. And let's say, like right now, in terms of memory like, that you can use, um, you're able to just work with a batch size of four. Gradient accumulation is going to uh, basically perform the optimization step only every few training steps. So what happens is, if you set an accumulation steps value to be four, the forward and backward pass for each batch of your training data, that happens as usual. But uh, in each of those steps, the gradients keep getting accumulated. They're never used in a weight update. The weight update happens only in like step four, like only every four steps. The effective batch size now, because you've accumulated over four steps, is 16. So you've been able to train with uh, 16 uh, batch size without actually f like increasing your activation memory. Coming to trade-offs, so this was like what I'd mentioned before. This a uh, yellow it depends marker here, but really like. It just depends on the baseline. And so you will see this reported differently. So it is, of course, going to be slower than just regular training at the same effective batch size. So if you're able to actually train with 16, and then you say, OK, I want to reduce the batch size to 4, and then turn on gradient accumulation, it's, of course, going to be slower than that. There's a lot more overhead now like in terms of doing multiple forward, backward passes. If you compare this with training without accumulation, which means the same batch size, and then you turn on accumulation. So for a batch size of four, in the previous example, it's going to be faster, of course, because you're skipping that optimization step now. And especially, it's going to be um, faster in a multi-GPU or multi-node setting, because you don't have to do gradient all reduce now. Um, every step, you're like skipping that. You're doing it only every uh, few steps. And the memory savings, of course, are only in the activations. So that's the only place where you will see batch size come up. And in the equation I'd mentioned before, like it's going to be linear, right? So that just gets scaled down now. OK, so just a broad overview again now to summarize like how all of these play in. So mixed precision affects all memory terms. It's going to give you better throughput. And in a low batch size setting, you might see an increase in memory if you just have mixed precision, simply because of that, uh, the gradient conversion and the master weight copy that's maintained. But all the, the rest of the optimizations, you will see a decrease in memory with different trade-offs. Uh, PFT and quantization, pretty clear, like they're just basically targeting different terms in, uh, in like weights optimizer gradients. These are places where your hyperparameter matters. You need to basically get the LoRa config right. And the quantization, like the data type has been like worked out for you. So from like a machine learning engineer perspective, like you don't have uh, much to do there. The, uh, the main point with quantization is that you're going to get worse throughput. And that's something to keep in mind. Gradient accumulation is going to scale down the batch size in your activation memory term. Gradient checkpointing will knock off terms in that activation memory equation by simply not retaining uh, any of them for like any batch size that you use. So here, any questions for everything we've discussed? Oh, model weights. Yeah, model memory. Yeah. Um, no, so, um, act, so, I mean, I guess the problem is the broad term I've used here. Uh, it's Q LoRa. Like, we're only talking about Q LoRa, nothing else. Uh, maybe there are, like, a quantization overall, there's, like, multiple. 
our quantization of our training methods. But for QLoda, it's only the weights because you just convert them back to float precision during training, and everything else proceeds as usual. And for gradients, you'll only be using, uh, you're only computing them for the LoRa weights, so the quantized weights don't come into the picture. Okay, so, oh. So, mixed precision can affect model performance, but in terms of, um, so in terms of what you're going to be working with, with FP16 or BF16, it in practice does not for fine tuning because like loss scaling, for example, for FP16 is implemented for you. So like in terms of what you need to do to get uh, same performance, uh, it kind of like doesn't matter. And BF16 has been like kind of shown to match full fine tuning performance. So it can technically affect, but in reality, like you don't really worry about it because there's been a lot of work in terms of library support to make it work for you. Yeah, maybe in pre-training stage, mixed position can affect in terms of convergence, but um, fine tuning, I think it's, it's fine in reality. Okay, so now in terms of like deciding between like what to choose and how to think about this. So this is like a high level decision tree. Uh, what you want to do is um, initially when you are fine tuning, right, costs can be like hundreds of gigabytes, 200, maybe even more than that. So the first step is to target your weights, optimizers, and gradients. So this is like trying to go from zero to one. And these are terms that are independent of batch size. And these are the first terms you want to like uh, try to get um, lesser memory usage out of. So mixed precision, it is up to you, but um, especially in a single GPU setting, like you can turn on mixed precision all the time for better throughput, and you'll end up having to use LoRa because um, like you, you never get like hundreds of gigabytes anyway for uh, like one GPU. But overall, mixed precision can be used by default because you can get away with like some parallelism strategy or a PFT strategy to reduce uh, memory. So you'll use this for throughput. And then um, here, like the way I've written this, right, it's like it's a way to kind of theoretically make a decision. You can, of course, try every single combination out, but that gets like messy pretty quickly. But what you can think about this is like you want to actually like train with just one batch size, right? So you want to think about total memory for that one batch size, and then you should like think about what's the excess compared with available memory. And you're going to think about training based on like, okay, like based on this excess, like am I off by like 100 gigabytes or tens of gigabytes? Maybe I have no option but to go for parameter efficient fine tuning. Even after that, if you're off maybe just by like 10 or a few gigabytes or a few more gigabytes, you're like, you can go to like the next step with just focusing on activation. But you would use quantization only if you're still cut short by, um, exact number depends, but maybe 20, 30 gigabytes and you have much less uh, VRAM than that. So the, the main reason why like you've got to be careful here is that like this is, just to get one bad size. That's the only reason why you would use quantization. You would never use it to like increase bad size. Like it doesn't make any sense because you're increasing bad size to kind of maybe have more utilization and get more throughput. But quantization will reduce throughput. So there's no point in trying to add that on and then like increasing bad size. So that's like the broad intuition. Uh, with this here, there's a lot more that I haven't actually mentioned. So there are optimizer alternatives like add a factor, for example, that will make memory uh, usage even more efficient. You can add that on um, right here uh, later on. Okay. So step two is you're going to be targeting. Model 
doing his contact and then the Laura like parameters are in some other precision. So we still add them back and like if we add them back with precision. During so um during training, what you do is you dequantize the quantized weights. For inference, yeah, you can dequantize and then merge. Yeah. Um, but also, I mean, uh, what you can do is you can, uh, it's probably better to just dequantize, merge. So do the addition in float precision, and then you can get that back down for quantized inference. So that is something you can do. Exactly right. So, so. Even with flash attention, with flash attention, what's happening is you don't have those intermediate attention matrices, right? And you're just keeping, I think, some with the softmax, you're keeping track of some scaling factors. QLoRa would operate the same way, which means, like, um, if you want to recompute the attention matrices, you would need to dequantize first and then recompute. So you'll still have that additional uh, time taken. And as a baseline, you'd compare with just flash attention. So it'll, of course, still be slower in terms of throughput there. I'm not sure I got your question. I'm asking, so just using QLoRa. Yeah. And then if I use QLoRa plus flash attention, would QLoRa plus flash attention be slower than just using QLoRa because of this dequantization that we need to do to compute the QLoRa plus flash attention, it should still be far. If you take QLoRa as the baseline, um, from what I've seen from like just experimenting with like small models on Colab, it, it flash attention will speed it up. So flash attention will add value there, um, precisely because like just beyond the extra recomputation time, uh, in terms of the redundant reads and writes that flash attention will save, that will like add up overall across like layers. So it'll still be faster if you compare with QLoRa. OK, so once you have um, thought about reducing like your model optimizer weights and gradients, you're now going to target activations. So here, if you're still in the 0 to 1 regime, which means you're still trying to squeeze out just one batch size, right? So in that case, and in only that case, you would probably go for gradient checkpointing. There's, of course, some more methods here not covered, but um, only if you're still in the zero to one setting is when you would go for checkpointing. And that's because, like, like you don't, of course, similar to like quantization, like if you're using a method which reduces throughput, you don't use it when you're increasing batch size. So if you want to increase batch size, you go for something like accumulation. And maybe like some other uh, methods, like a different fused optimizer or something. So that's the broad like intuition. And then if you're still stuck, you would there might be some back and forth, because so it's pretty hard to get this right for different um, setups, different hardware setups, especially like consumer hardware. So you might have to think if you've used everything like quantization, PEFT, et cetera. And then uh, finally, if you're still stuck, you might have to go for like offloading or using like a smaller model. And yeah, that's just like the high level uh, decision tree to kind of think about. So till now, I've been making like memory consumption seem very precise and how you can like calculate everything uh, all like in your calculator. But there's a bunch of other like uh, places where memory usage kicks in, which is why, like, when you do like benchmark and try to look at memory usage, you will see like things don't match um, theory that much. And one uh, place is CUDA kernels. So 
these are kernels that are loaded onto the GPU by like your framework. With PyTorch, if you like want to like just load a one element tensor right now, like on many GPUs, like you'll probably see like 300 megabytes of memory usage just for like a one element tensor. And that's because there's additional overhead from the framework and also kernels being loaded. Um, and there's one estimate like that you can like try out and you can get and you can assume like a max of maybe one gigabyte or so. You need to discount that in available memory. There's going to be temporary buffers. So one uh, good example of this is in checkpointing, like I'd mentioned, like during the backward pass, you have to recompute intermediate activations. And so that recomputation, during that recomputation, all of those uh, activations between in like one layer stay in memory. And they might get cleared out, but PyTorch has to reserve that for you which means like that will come under peak memory usage and you still need that if you want to train without like OM. One more uh, place which um, is not something that I've profiled is memory fragmentation. And this is one example from like the zero paper. And again, like uh, you can think about this just for the simple case of checkpointing where you will have uh, long-lived activations, which are like the intermediate activations that are checkpointed, the actual checkpoints, and you also have short-lived activations which get cleared out, all the ones which are not checkpointed. And they can be placed side by side in memory. And so once memory is freed, like you'll see all these holes and you won't have enough contiguous memory sometimes for memory allocation. Uh, typically, uh, with checkpointing, if you do like try to measure on single GPU, you will see some additional memory usage because of uh, temporary buffers, but also most likely due to uh, fragmentation. Uh, and there can be some more depending on like the exact um, algorithm you're running. And right now, I guess in terms of like how you calculate, how you think about this, these two factors are pretty hard to measure. I would say like. If you think about this in even like multi-GPU settings, it gets even more messy. But at least for single GPU, maybe a few gigabytes to be discounted for, for available memory, and one gigabyte for the kernels, and then you can like kind of make it precise with like the uh, decision tree I'd mentioned before. So key takeaways, um, hopefully some intuition for uh, efficient, but fast fine tuning, thinking about throughput and uh, balancing that out with memory usage and some intuition for a low rank quantization which terms of memory and like what trade offs you have. And as you can see, like every byte will matter. So if you can use a better op a different optimizer or if you can use LoRa, like you should go for it because every byte scales up to like gigabytes when you're dealing with billions of parameters some, hopefully some ideas for batch size, um, utilization, throughput, like what all of these kind of, what do you want to maximize, why you do it, some intuition for that. And hopefully like if you do end up saying, thinking like, okay, like I wanted to increase batch size, so I'm like adding quantization, that should now be a red flag, like you can't do that. Um, that doesn't make sense if you're really trying to maximize throughput. And there's a lot more that I haven't mentioned since I didn't want to like just load this up with information in terms of fused optimizers for better throughput, a compilation, et cetera, that you can read more about. And of course, a big thing that I should have mentioned, but it's um, probably going to be too much, is multi-GPU setups and also choosing like the right uh, parallelism strategy. And these are just some links to read more about the same topics. So I would say like the first link from Stas Beckman, who's worked on a lot of large scale training uh, at Hugging Face. Uh, this is excellent for just about everything when it comes to training and you should check it out. The second link also has some more uh, interesting like optimizers that are available for you in like Hugging Face. So you can check that out. And the last two are, they're okay. Okay, thank you. Questions?